Welcome to tonight's program at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Anya Manuel, and I'll be your moderator tonight. I am a founding partner along with Condoleezza Rice and Bob Gates in a strategic consulting firm and also teach at Stanford. In fact, I just finished teaching my class and we taught Amy's book. So um, she was nice enough to give us advanced copies and it is a wonderful book that we're gonna spend an hour talking about tonight and we hope you all will read going forward. So joining us tonight is Amy Webb. She's a quantitative futurist and the founder of the Future Today Institute, which is a leading foresight and strategy firm that advises Fortune 500 companies, international NGOs, and government agencies. She's also professor at the NYU Stern School of Business and previously worked as a journalist in Japan and Hong Kong as a game theory and economics teaching assistant, and even as a piano and clarinet teacher. So as her wealth of different experiences suggest, she believes that the global challenges that are faced by business and technology and society are highly interdisciplinary. This belief is also apparent in her new book that's just out called The Big Nine, How Tech Titans and Their Thinking Machines Could Warp Humanity. Uh, the prediction center on the effects of artificial intelligence, and she gives three scenarios about the future, which we'll hear a bit more about. Uh, the optimistic, the pragmatic sort of current path, and the catastrophic. And she provides some very practical measures to address these very pressing issues. We're very excited to have Amy here with us tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Amy Webb to the Commonwealth Club. Amy, let me just start you out. Um, we met last summer at a conference, and uh, I was blown away by the things you talked about there. You, in your book, give a wonderful description of how the AI ecosystem works, both in the US, which what you call the G Mafia, and in China with what you term the bats. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by that and how the ecosystem differs in each country? Sure. So. You know, when it comes to artificial intelligence, there's a tremendous amount of misunderstanding, and I think a lot of misplaced optimism and fear. Part of that is because we've been living with the idea of AI for so long. And depending on when you grew up, artificial intelligence to you might be Rosie the Robot from the Jetsons. Uh, it might be Skynet from the Terminator. It might be Doris in Westworld. But most of the time when the average person thinks about artificial intelligence, they're not thinking about tiny little programs that make decisions using data, which at the heart of this is what AI actually is. So you know, there's a tremendous amount of misplaced optimism and fear at the same time that there's a significant consolidation happening within that ecosystem. So there are nine companies that have the overwhelming number of patents. Um, they, have significant, um, they have significant funding. They're able to attract the top talent. They have some of the best partnerships with universities, research and otherwise. Um, and on top of all of that, it's their custom frameworks, it's their silicon, it's, it's uh, their code bases. Um, and as a result, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a concentration of power that, that's really focused on a very small number of people who are now building systems to make decisions for all of us. So, um, and, and as a result of all of that, artificial intelligence, which is a fundamental game-changing technology, in fact, it's, it's many technologies in our third era of computing, um, there, it's on different developmental tracks. So in China, uh, there are the BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. It seems like all we hear about these days is Huawei which is another big Chinese company. Um, but in many ways, those other three are far more important. They are building more. Um, they have... Uh, in know, the AI space. That's right, in, in the AI space. Um, now, these are technically public companies uh, with independent CEOs, but by virtue of the fact that they are Chinese companies, uh, based in China, they are very much under the thumb of Beijing. Uh, and this is important because China has a, a leader, Xi Jinping, uh, who I think is brilliant. He's a brilliant strategist. He 
understands technology, and he's a very gifted long-term thinker. And for China, the long-term um, planning in AI is helping aid and abet um, a lot of state run initiatives and programs, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit. Mm -hmm. Now, it's different in the United States. In the United States, we have what I call the G Mafia. So that's Google, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, Apple, and Facebook. These are um, publicly traded companies that have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. Um, and I, I do not believe uh, that these companies are evil um, or that they have evil intentions for humanity. The problem in our country is that we don't have a single capital. Uh, we have three epicenters of power. One is in Washington, DC. That's our government. One is in New York City. Those are our financial institutions. Um, and the other is here in Silicon Valley. That's technology. These three epicenters are what make our country run. And they have sometimes conflicting relationships with each other, and they are all codependent. So the problem that we have in the United States is that the financial sector demands commercialization of all this technology and prioritizes speed over safety. Um, the problem in Washington, DC, is that there are far too many, sorry, far too few policymakers and elected officials who actually understand what all this stuff is. And the problem. I second that. <laughs> it's my opinion, but I'm right. Uh, <laughs> and the problem in the Valley is that um, there's been such animosity that, uh, and, and so many years not bridging the divide, um, that in my observation, um, the policy piece of this sort of doesn't matter. And the move fast, break things, apologize for it after the fact ethos. Uh, has resulted in, I think, um, AI reshaping democracy in a way that doesn't have our, our best term, our best long-term interests at the center. So, so this is where we're at. In the year 2019, by virtue of being alive today, you are being continuously mined, refined, prop, you know, optimized, productized, and monetized. Um, in ways that you don't recognize. And the question that I'm asking in this book is what happens when, if we keep AI on these two um, different trajectories over the next several decades as the algorithms and the systems that use them become ever more powerful um, and humans recede from those decision-making <coughs> processes. My concern is that in light of other, so, let me just, I will say one more thing and then, and then we'll talk. But like, one of the problems when, we, when, when companies and leaders and individuals pay attention to technology, we forget to make connections to other things. So when you think about AI and China and the BAT, you also have to look at the, a different acronym, three-letter acronym, BRI. Um, and that is the, the Belt and Road Initiative, which for those who are familiar with, um, looks like an infrastructure program for emerging markets. So the Chinese government has been in parts of Africa, um, in South America, uh, building uh, physical bridges, making repairs in an effort to uh, enhance trade. Um, but it's also been laying fiber. And it's also been deploying fi uh, small cells. Um, it has actual 5G, not our American market, like marketing 5G. It has real 5G that it's, it's deploying. And it's also deploying data collection methods. Um, and, and from my vantage point, this very much looks like a very smart leader, Xi Jinping, um, developing it in, right before our eyes, a new world order, one in which uh, you know, 100 or more countries from around the world are aligned with China at the same time that here in the United States, we are retreating from the global stage. We're fostering animosity between ourselves and other countries. Uh, uh, and we are being inculcated in, in sort of this idea that we can't trust anybody or anything. So we blame big tech, and we yell at big tech, and we believe that things are fake news. Um, you know, and this isn't helping us out um, because, because this scattershot approach means that we're, we're at the moment sort of wasting time at this, at this critical moment. Mm -hmm.
That's great. I want to get back to China in a minute because you and I are going to have a lot to say about that because I also work on China issues and we see it from different angles. But let me just stay with the U.S. for a minute and the G Mafia. You have a couple chapters in the book that lay out in a way, in a clearer way than I've seen to date. What are the potential problems with AI? So we all are reading these newspaper articles that are fear mongering. And many of you have probably seen the YouTube video of the killer drones. But you make the argument that that's not really what we should be worried about. What are the concerns? So this, the concerns that I have is that we have, a, again, this consolidation of power by a relative few number of people working for just a few number of organizations who, again, I think have, have the, our best interests at the forefront. Um, but in, in practice, we're starting to see some problems. So, um, you know, Amazon, uh, in its effort to automate our homes, to optimize our lives, is also starting to shut off our permissions in ways that they may not have intended. Um, one example is that I love to use is, is a microwave that you can talk to. So there's an Amazon Basics microwave, uh, which, you know, instead of pushing the buttons on the keypad to pop your popcorn, you just ask a, a, the A word, Alexa, um, to, to, to pop the popcorn for you, right? So that may seem frivolous, that may seem like novelty. From my vantage point, it's a brilliant move to collect additional data because once the pa once you, or you know, if you order stuff from Amazon and it shows up at your house, the, the data trail ends at that point. Um, however, once you open up the box and you put the microwave popcorn into the microwave, Amazon now knows not just that you've consumed, or at least popped the popcorn with an intent to consume it, um, but it also, <laughs> it also understands uh, the emotional state that you're in. Um, it understands who, you know, who else was in the room at that moment in time when you popped the popcorn, what the weather was like, and over a longer period of time, it can make a lot of different correlations. What else is Amazon working on besides connected microwaves. Well, there's a joint venture between uh, Amazon Berkshire Hathaway and JP Morgan Chase around health. Um, and we're all wearing more and more devices that collect our biometric information. So if we take this out a number of years, to me, it's entirely plausible that you know, on a Friday afternoon, you're in your office or in your home and you want popcorn and you ask Alexa to pop your popcorn for you and Alexa looks to see how many calories you've burned um, <laughs> and what your overall level of fitness is and you don't get to eat the popcorn. Uh, or if you live in Austin, Texas, which has had a lot of droughts lately, um, maybe the washing machine decides that you can get another use out of your jeans. Now, these don't seem like, you know, horrifically bad, catastrophic outcomes. However, they have, a, they have a compounding effect. And what I see starting to happen is we, we, it feels like we have all of these choices. I think in reality what's happening is um, all of these systems that are intended to nudge us into better health, um, intended to nudge us to help um, make our lives easier, or to help us consume uh, fewer things, over time, they become restrictions. And for those of you who remember the, blue, the dreaded blue screen um, if, you know, on earlier computers and having your permissions denied, my concern is that our everyday life becomes 100 million different permissions that get denied in different ways. Um, and, and I just feel like that's a world that I, I don't want to live in. That's, that's one issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are many, many other issues uh, that, that go along with this. And again, I, I don't think this is, I don't think this is, um, I don't think any, there's like a mad genius inside of Google who's decided that the, like they want to control the population in this way. I think it really is, this is complicated technology with a lot of different people and a rush to commercialize. And nobody is thinking about the downstream implications. There is no uh, way to positively monetize risk modeling. The money that gets spent to do risk modeling, to do auditing, to shore up some of these problems in advance, you don't make back. So there's no economic incentive um, to fix some of these things. Right. Well, and so I sort of put it in my mind as 
one worry about AI that I hadn't had is I sort of characterized what you just described as the revenge of the internet of things, right? When the refrigerator tells you you can't have ice cream <laughs> right. or everything's beeping at you every minute to say, go exercise, what right, you just right. described. You also described two other things. One is the bias that's becoming implicit because our data sets are often biased. And, um, well, why don't you talk about that? And you had a sure. couple of others too. Privacy, I thought, was the other yeah. big one. That was my takeaway. So I think when it comes to bias and autonomous decision-making systems, it should come as no surprise that um, bias is baked into these systems. I think the, the piece that may be surprising to you is that it's not just women and people of color. We're all being discriminated against. If you are conservative and you have conservative political leanings, you are being discriminated against in your Facebook feed um, when you are at Facebook, and that's an algorithmic uh, decision. Um, you know, if you are somebody... Uh, and how is that? Pardon me? How are you being discriminated against? Um, because... Uh, Let's say, like, aside from overtly scandalous content that's intended to get people to interact, um, the news feed. Th th and this is not my research. This is somebody else's research that was uh, that was verified and that has been publicly available for a long time. The news feed um, portion of the of the site was displaying liberal leaning stories, and it was discriminating against um, conservative leaning. That's right. Um, you know, depending on what image search you perform on, on Google, um, you are very likely not going to be shown a broad spectrum of the human condition. You're going to be shown a relatively narrow one. Um, so again, like it's, it's, not, it's not just me, it's not just you, it's not just a person of color. You know, all of us in some way um, are, are finding um, ourselves restricted because of bias in the systems. Now, where does the bias come from? So uh, when algorithms learn, they need a, an initial corpora. They, they need a data set. Um, those data sets uh, are difficult to put together. So historically, there have just been a handful of data sets that research scientists tend to use to, to train their systems on. Um, it's, it's widely known that you know those like image uh, data sets, the text data sets, reflect a very Caucasian American point of view. Um, and so, for example, there was a, the, one of the, the image data sets, if you type in bride, you see basically a woman wearing a white wedding dress. Now, all of us know that there are plenty of other options when you get married, um, but, but that's what shows up. Um, so, so that's part of the problem. Another part of the problem is when there's a brand new database that somebody wants to create, they go out looking for structured data. And again, it, it's a time-consuming, expensive process. So they're pulling structured data out of Wikipedia, which we already know is <laughs> riddled with bias because of the preponderance of white males who edit those stories. Now, to its credit, IBM tried to develop a brand new data set that had many more, that had faces that were far more representative of the general public. It, it took those um, faces uh, from Flickr. So for anybody who uploaded their photos to Flickr, and, and most people didn't realize that by checking a Creative Commons license, it meant that anybody could then use those photos in a non-commercial way. So IBM you know, to its credit, tried to build a better database, but wasn't transparent about it. And then a bunch of people found out that their faces were being used to train machine learning algorithms, and everybody freaked out. Um, so, so bias is an issue, but it's an addressable issue. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is that, again, we have these, these three epicenters of power uh, in the United States, tech, finance, and uh, government. And who is going to pay for auditing and shoring up and cleaning up all of these systems? Mm -hmm. Um, there's no financial motive to do that. And regulation would not be a good way forward for many reasons. So we've, we've, we have a little bit of a problem. And I think you give examples in the book that I say, that I would say are even um, tougher to deal with. And one is that algorithms are being increasingly used in making sentencing decisions. Mm -hmm. Or who gets to go on parole. Or who's getting housing. That's right. And so... What may seem trite in certain things, like, oh, well, so well, who cares if it's an image of a woman in a white dress, wedding dress, may very soon becomes very, very difficult. Oh, yeah, the with. stakes are high here. Yeah. And so I think, some of, I think it's probably pretty well known at this point that um, there are predictive 
um, systems that are used by law enforcement agencies to, to try to figure out in advance if an inmate is released what the probable recidivism rate might be. Um, but, th but there's also predictive systems being used to, as the first line read on resumes. Right. So for a lot of people, and, and the, the like weird ironic thing is that a lot of CS computer science grads who are entering the workforce, their resumes are being read not by a human editor, hiring manager, but by, no, but by a like an AI as its first read. And, and they're people who diverted a little bit and intentionally tried to broaden their worldview by taking policy classes or by taking an art history class or something that we all know would make them better at their job, that looks like an anomaly because AI, you know, like, like a lot of these systems, they, they don't like flexibility. Um, so it looks like an anomaly, therefore that resume gets thrown out. So the, the, like, the, the like crazy thing is um, that systems that were intended to create efficiencies and bring in the best and the brightest, um, there's widespread evidence that they've been discriminating against the very best people um, simply because there was an anomaly on their resume. Mm -hmm. Great, keep going through the potential problems, and then we'll talk about oh, how, how much solve time them. do we have. Yeah, well, we've got, a, we've got 45 minutes. <laughs> we've got a Nick lot of problems me. to talk about. <laughs> exactly. You also talk about privacy and who owns our data, and you actually have what I thought was a really beautiful solution that involves blockchain. So can you say a little bit more about how the privacy issue plays out in maybe in your catastrophic scenario mm -hmm. and versus the positive scenario. Sure, so there's so much promise in using our data for all number of different purposes that this is a hot area right now of R&D. It's also a great place for AI research. I'll give you an example that's not in the book that I think will probably shock a lot of people in this room. Walmart is working on a connected shopping cart. So um, you, you Put your, lay your hands on the shopping cart, and it takes a baseline reading of your temperature, your heart rate, um, and how hard you're pressing down on the, on the cart. And then as you move throughout the store, um, there's a machine learning algorithm that's looking for changes, for blips. So if your heart rate, you're standing in an aisle, and your heart rate spikes, um, or you're, you know, you're gripping much harder than you were, you know, like um, that, that shopping cart will send a ping to a store associate uh, to send them over to, you know, you standing in aisle two, like angrily looking at the Captain Crunch, um, and I think that yeah, for real. And the I, you know, the, one of the stated ideas is to you know help improve the shopping experience as the customer moves throughout the store, and also make sure customers aren't blowing a gasket. But let's think about the again, like how else could that information be used? Well, this information becomes super useful to the makers of Captain Crunch um, and to its competitors, right? Because you have so much more, under, you know, better understanding of how people are making their buying decisions. Um, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of different tiny bits of biometric information that we're shedding all the time. So when we think about privacy and data, we tend to think about the stuff that's obvious to us, like our email, our social media, uh, when we're moving around on the internet, how we're being tracked. Maybe some people are aware of how their photos are being tagged. We tend not to be very alert and aware of all of these other things. Um, what I think is going to start happening over time um, that I explain in, in the book is that um, all of these various points of data, whether it's our grip strength as we push our grocery carts or our Fitbit data and, or our microwave popcorn habits, um, all of these different points wind up in a singular record, which I'm calling a, I would call a personal data record. Um, and the strategic advantage there is uh, pretty obvious. Um, it helps uh, standardize some of the biometric data and the other data collections so to make it easier for everybody to use. Um, I think what will wind up happening is uh, for consumers, it gets housed either by Amazon, Google, or Apple, uh, which effectively means that you are an Amazon family, a Google family, uh, or an Apple family. And at the moment, I don't see any of that data being interoperable. Um, I see it being locked into these systems. And you know, if you're somebody who's had a hard time switching over from your Apple phone to an Amazon uh, to a uh, an Android phone, like imagine having to switch your family 
or your house, right? I mean, this becomes untenable. The, the benefit to having a, a singular record is that it could be heritable. So you could pass it, you, you know, the, the optimistic view is that these companies become stewards, not owners. Um, and you have some control over who gets access to it when. And maybe you can pass it down to your children so that they can have a deeper understanding of their own health um, or, or some other issues as time wears on. Um, well, or most importantly, you have perfect control and you can say, you may see my children's photos right. and you may not. You may see my health record That's and right. you may not. Where right now, so much data is just out there in the ether and being used in ways that aren't often transparent to us. Right, and so the transparency piece of this is often what gets these companies in hot water. It's why we have calls for regulation um, out of DC, and it freaks everybody out in the financial sector. So, so to the blockchain point, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if uh, we did have a personal data record and it was interoperable, and we and and you know it was housed at Google, Amazon, um, or Apple, and and uh, we were able to give permissions um, as we saw fit. But also, there was a they were attached to a distributed ledger, uh, and there was a log created that you could access at any time to see. Um, as, your PD, as, as that data record moved around, ha, where those packets of information were moving. And at every point, um, as various players in the chain made their money on your data, which is already happening, you got you know, some fraction of a penny for every one of those transactions. That becomes a workable uni universal basic income. right? That is a completely different approach where everybody wins. Um, the regulators no longer have to regulate uh, because there's, and, and consumers get transparency. The big tech companies don't have to worry about the regulation, and the finance folks don't have to worry about huge fines on the horizon. And, and the amount of money that's being siphoned off isn't really that significant. Um, and we're able to deal with impending uh, workforce changes. The problem is that in our current setup, there's no, like, I don't, I don't know how you would. I don't know that we have an instrument in our democratic system because it's not quite a policy as we, you know, as we've seen recently executive orders, there's a lot of them, they're not self-executing, no. nothing seems to happen after they get signed. Um, so, so, but, but that's part of the purpose of this book. Um, it, we, it's 2019, we need a totally different approach. And in order for us to achieve success, we all have to push up our sleeves and be willing to do the hard work. Mm -hmm. I want to get to solutions in a minute, but I already have two questions on the issue I was going to get to next, which, of course, what's on everyone's mind and always in the newspaper is the future of jobs. Oh, yeah. Are the robots going to come and take my job, which surprisingly you don't hear people talking about in China. That's right. I mean, there's a much more optimistic view towards what artificial intelligence can do and not this gloom and doom. But so describe how you see that in the West. Um, I loved that you pointed that out because one of the core differences right now between the United States and China is optimism. Mm -hmm. um, we, are, we are anxious. Um, you know, we are having a very difficult time confronting deep uncertainties, and we are starting to make really stupid decisions under duress. Yeah. You don't I see that call in, it, we're in a, For the first time, the West really feels like it's in a defensive crouch. That's right. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. That's right. Um, you know, here's the deal with jobs. And it's not politically popular, so you don't hear people say this very often. I say it as often as I can, because we got to acknowledge some hard truths. There are a whole bunch of people that are going to be out of a job, and there's no way to upskill them and bring them back into the workforce. If I hear one more startup or, or like nice guy with great ambitions who's going to teach all the coal miners in West Virginia how to code, um, I mean, it's it's an it's. You know, here's the problem. Here's the problem with that kind of hubris. These are people who have never sat for eight hours at a time at a computer. So they're not just learning how to code. They're learning how to be a different, fundamentally different kind of person. You're going to teach them how to code during a time when Google's machine learning code is already writing better code on its own than the original people who wrote the machine learning code. So, so we're going to train all of these people who are going to wind up with obsolete skills five to seven years from now. 
and my, my concern about that is not just, well, now we have to figure out a, a new place to put these people so they can earn an income. My concern is, like, how demoralizing is that going to be? Um, you know, so the best thing for us to do is to acknowledge, I mean, and, and to, like, accept the fact that a bunch of people are going to be automated out of work and there is nothing for them. You know, it's, it's, um, it's just not going to happen. Sort of a transition generation that you need That's to right. take care of. My dad, and then teach my dad the new was, generation differently. My dad was one of the people that, that got automated out of work. He was a salesman for many, many, many years. He was really, doesn't have a, I'm the first person on, my, um, on his side of the family to go to college. He's brilliant, grew up uh, with parents who were subsistence farmers, and there weren't a lot of options. So uh, when ordering online and e-commerce um, made it easier for companies to expand, he was one of the people that got automated out of work. My dad is brilliant, but he doesn't have a college degree. He doesn't know how to use a computer. And he got automated out of a job at, at age 68. So what, what, like, you know, and it's been horrible. Um, it's horrible when you lose a job. You lose your sense of purpose. Uh, so... You know, there's, and I'm, I'm the first person to say that my father is, a, he is brilliant. He's incredibly hardworking. Like, you can't teach him how to code. That doesn't solve the problem. Um, so we got to think of something else. Here's the something else that we ought to be thinking long and hard about. One is, does it make, you know, the curricula that we have in our universities, but most importantly, our K through 12 education systems, those curriculum those curricula reflect the anxieties of older people who are concerned about the future of technology. So in our zeal to teach every kid how to code, somehow we have forgotten that we also need to teach kids critical thinking and logic and philosophy. And you know what? Religion is good too, uh, and comparative lit. Um, so that we have, you know, again, like, the, like I have an eight-year-old, my eight, and my eight-year-old lives in a home full of robots, so it's a different situation. But, <laughs> but um, it's when you have Amy as a mother. <laughs> but she has a fundamentally different understanding of the world because she's only ever had a world full of technology. And the people who are writing the curriculum, to a, you know, it's in like we must teach all kids how to code, it, code, code, right? Versus the fundamentals and the, and the background, the ethics, and all of those other things. They're just responding to their own anxieties. The difference, but, but there's a difference between what we're doing here and what is happening in China. Um, so again, like a lot of things that are these big national plans in China sound great on paper and don't actually work in the real world. How, so that being said, um, there's a brand new textbook that started to roll out, um, and it's machine learning, and it's being taught in kindergarten. So obviously, kindergartners aren't doing multiple regressions but they're learning basics and fundamentals and a different way to think, uh, you know, a different way to think. Um, in the United States, I, I mean, how many of our cities in public schools don't have textbooks because they're not funded, right? So, so th this workforce issue that everybody loves, everybody wants a number. Exactly how many people are gonna be out of a job right. in exactly which sectors? And you can go to McKinsey and look at their report, and you go to Deloitte and look at their report, um, or we can just stop making projections and start working on actual solutions. So for all of these people who are gonna be automated out of work, now is a really good time to think about how to pay us for our data that's moving around in a way that everybody wins. Um, if, we're if we're really that concerned about the future of the workforce, then maybe we ought to shore up our education system. Right. Like That's a really good thing that we could be doing before the robots get here to, to kill us all. Right? That's an easy, easy fix. Mm -hmm. Let me give you one more example on education, because it's so front and center for us here in San Francisco, too. My kids go to an experimental school in San Francisco called the Alt School. and. We love it, they love it, and the whole theory behind the school is teach critical thinking, teach curiosity, teach love of learning, let every child move at its pace in whatever subject they're in, because you don't know what they'll need to know 20 years mm -hmm. from now. To your point of don't teach coding now, because that's sort of the issue of the 80s. 
maybe yeah. in 20 years, the machines will yeah. be coding yeah. and you need to do something else, right? And teach social emotional skills. Right. But those are, those experiments are too few and far between. And I'll give you one more example. In China, there are now enormous incentives for students to switch their major at the great universities to AI. And the overflow of people wanting to go into this space is just uh, enormous. Mm -hmm. One image always sticks with me. I was at a China World Internet Conference a couple years back. It's sort of China's vision of the internet. It's a frightening one. Got back to my hotel at 11 o'clock, and the lobby is filled with 2,000 people. And I thought, wow, is some rock star showing up? Is it Xi Jinping? Who's going to be there? All oh, They all have their smartphones out. They're about to take a video. In walks. Jack Ma, the CEO of Alibaba. And a cheer goes up, you know, as if it's the Beatle. That's what everyone in China wants to be. And it's seen very positive. It's such a different because feeling of the optimism. And people, than, you and know, Mark Zuckerberg up there being grilled. No, but I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that you told us that story because it illustrates a, a challenge that we have. There's a sense of optimism and that people have an opportunity to move up and to do great things. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't have, you know, we are clinging to some past vision um, in the United States. One last thing on education, um, you know, the robots that everybody's so worried about don't yet have the fine motor skills to do all the stuff that we think they're going to do. Um, we don't have the physical infrastructure within a lot of our buildings to facilitate um, taking away the latency so that those collaborative robotics can work with each other, which is my way of saying um, we, ha we already have a gap in the United States. We have a deficit. We have too few people in the trades, um, <laughs> which is only getting worse. Uh, and so, again, like in our zeal to teach every kid to code, we've made it so that going into the trades uh, or you know, pursuing a career in like cutting hair um, is somehow, it makes you less American. Uh, or, and we look down upon those people. Uh, we actually are going to wind up needing those people and we're not gonna have enough of them um, over the next, you know, decade and a half, two decades, while we're all worried about the robots coming mm -hmm. to take the jobs. Great, I wanna move quickly to China and then solutions, but let me back up for one question because one of these actually raised it for me. Um, we should have probably started with this. You give a wonderful explanation in the beginning of your book about the difference between narrow AI and general AI and the question, I'll just read it, is in finance, there are literally hundreds of fintech companies developing AI solutions, and you said there's only nine companies really doing AI. So can you draw that distinction sure. for the big AI development, how it's working, what general AI is, mm -hmm. what narrow and applied AI is? Yeah, so again, these nine companies are clearly not the only ones. I mean, we're in San Francisco. Salesforce has got an entire team doing AI stuff. Uber's got a whole team do, doing AI stuff. Um, what I'm saying is that all roads at some point lead back to these nine, okay? So you can't, you know, even Salesforce doesn't work um, without Google and Amazon in, in, in some capacity, and Microsoft. Um, so, so that's those big nine. Now, um, yes, there is an entire ecosystem. This market is flooded with capital. There's, again, a lot of excitement over exuberance about what the possibilities are. Um, and so we are seeing a ton, and, and FinTech is certainly a big piece of this. So we see all of these startups and all of these things happening. Um, here's, again, where a little bit of knowledge goes a long way. So, uh, my, you know, I, the, the best, so, so let me very quickly again just say that the first chapter of the book uh, is all about, it's a quick, like here's what you missed on Glee version of AI. Um, and it's intended for anybody to, to understand it. Again, artificial intelligence is only uh, systems that make automatic decisions using data. That's really it. And, and it happens in many different ways. Um, there are narrow decisions. So this is artificial narrow intelligence. This is when you back your car up and it goes beep, beep, so that you don't hit anything. That's artificial narrow intelligence. Um, as AI uh, systems become stronger, um, they evolve. And so what comes after artificial narrow intelligence is called artificial general intelligence or strong AI. Um, and after that, 
is artificial superintelligence, which I'll get to in a second. Um, with a, one of the challenges in the field is that there's not a, an agreed upon set of tests. And the tests that do exist to help us figure out where we are and how much the machines can comprehend, those tests have always been built on either replication or deception. Um, you know, we're either teaching machines how to deceive us uh, or each other or how to replicate us. Um, and we keep you know, telling ourselves this narrative that we're building systems modeled after the human brain. They, they may be to some extent, um, but these machines are never going to think like us. They're not going to. Uh, so alien intelligence is a much better descriptor than artificial intelligence. Now on AGI, um, I would argue that we've already seen the first examples of artificial general intelligence. Um, this was a couple weeks ago when DeepMind, which is a subsidiary of Google, um, released its Alpha Zero program. So you may remember Alpha, th this is the, the group that built uh, Alpha Go, which was an AI that learned how to play um, Go, the board game Go, and at some point got as good as the world's grandmasters. In fact, it beat many of them, it demoralized them, and they finally had to retire it. It got re-released. And for China, it's hard to um, emphasize too much how much of a wake-up call this was for China. Oh, yeah. They suck because Go is a Chinese game. It's seen as the ultimate strategy game. It's much more complex than chess. So when the great world champion, who happens to be Chinese, was beaten, China really saw this as its Sputnik moment to say, oh, my gosh, the West is ahead. we got to catch up. That's right. That's right. Um, and they, and they continued, so the team kept plowing forward. Uh, so the next iteration of this algorithm was AlphaGo Zero, which uh, had initial parameters, learn how to play Go, and then see what happens without supervised learning. So the system, uh, over a short period of time, got as good as it was before, and then, then they let it keep going. And in a shorter period of time, um, it went, it, it sort of made a decision. The human strategy got thrown out. It developed its own strategy and kept playing. Um, and, it, and it was so good and so confusing to humans that we couldn't quite figure out how it was doing what it was doing. OK, so that was interesting. And it was an additional, it, that also was a huge cause for concern in China. Well, a couple of weeks ago, they released the next iteration of that, which is called Alpha Zero. Alpha Zero. Uh, learned without a human in the loop how to play three games. This is an example of something called multitask learning. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, these were complementary games, uh, but learning how to do many things at one time is an example, it's an early example of a generally intelligent system. But we don't, you know, it's not a walking, talking robot. So the AI community, of course, heralds this as a, as a it was a big boom. And it's hard to describe to That's laymen right. because, but everyday people. So we got this is this is this is why I'm trying. Like we got to flip the narrative here. Y you have like AI is already here. It's not on the horizon. Um, the walking talking robots don't matter. There was a walking talking robot in 1939 called the Westinghouse Moto Man. Okay, we've seen it. This stuff is a little bit more boring, but far more profound. And so my my ask of every single person sitting in this room and every single person listening and watching is that you are able to explain in layman's terms, just like I can, what AI is, what it isn't, and why it matters. Um, if, if all of us could do that, we would all be in such a better place right now. Mm -hmm. That's an easy, easy thing that anybody can do. Mm -hmm. And I always, when, when I'm talking to my class about this, I got the questions of, well, so what? These are games. But very soon you have use cases that are intelligent portfolio trading. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. But if you, after a while, if you've got most of the stock market tr traded through artificial intelligence and humans can't explain why the trades were made the way they were, maybe you end up with a financial crisis. Maybe you don't. Right. right. And we make the assumption that just because we built the systems and the systems work, that they're never going to not work or that they're not going to behave in a way that we didn't think about in advance. So we've got, you know, there's an unprecedented number of undocumented AI accidents that have occurred in the past 12 months that you never hear about. No one there, has to report them. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, but these are problems. They're addressable problems. If only we could get investors to, to take a breath, 
like t take it easy and let these companies um, do risk modeling and uh, work a little slower. Um, and if DC folks uh, would understand these systems better before they start writing policy. Mm -hmm. Getting to China, the, <laughs> you know, the panda in the back of the room. Uh, you said a little bit about how Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent are different from the G-Mafia. And one of the big differences is that they coordinate extremely closely with the Chinese government. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. And what worries you about it? Sure. So, you know, I don't think that anybody would come out publicly and acknowledge this, but it's no accident that Baidu is the company that works on self-driving cars. Um, that Tencent is the company that's working on healthcare, right? right? Um, so, so there's an incredibly coordinated effort. And on the one hand, you could argue that that reduces innovation and competition, and therefore maybe the end product is not going to be as good as it could have been. On the other hand, it really streams, it streamlines a lot of activities, um, and and through a coordinated effort, helps some of these, you know, helps these companies, I think, get a little further ahead. We should also remember that China's got a whole lot of people in it, uh, and they don't have the same privacy restrictions as exist in the EU, um, and they don't have people getting upset like we do in the United States, uh, which, you know, again, then more data doesn't necessarily mean better outcomes. Sometimes it just means more data. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, you know, I would argue that some of the systems coming out of China are world class simply because they don't have the same restrictions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would add with my former U.S. government official hat on, um, it is quite clear that anything developed in a private AI lab in China is shared with the government, including the Chinese military. And in the U.S., um, the ethos of Silicon Valley and Washington is so far separate, even though you know, the Defense Department funded all the storied early Silicon Valley companies, Varian, Fairchild Semiconductor, Hewlett Packard, those all, there was an enormous bridge between the government and Silicon Valley in the beginning. It's broken. Mm -hmm. And I never see a bigger disconnect than when I have conversations about this topic in Washington and everyone's up in arms about the Chinese and angry about Google back backing out of Project Maven, which maybe you want to say a word about, and out here where people say, well, why would we collaborate with them? Right. So maybe you can say more about Yeah. That. So, you know, I think, again, we, we have such short memories. Um, you know, peace requires investment and work. Um, living in a peaceful society is not all that different from living in a happy marriage. You know, if you like think about the people in your lives that you know who have been married, like legitimately happy, uh, not pretend happy for the neighbors. Um, <laughs> but like think of all the people that you know who have been married for a very, very, very long time. Um, there are ups and downs, but mostly there's a lot of compromise, there's transparency, right? And it's work. It's work. Peace requires work. We are we have the luxury of sitting in this beautiful room, talking about these things without the threat of, of bombs hitting us, because we have a strong military, um, we have a well-funded military, and we've got really good technology. So now, the issue is that our government has not done anywhere close to an adequate level of R&D in technologies. They've left it to the military. The military, I would argue, has not funded adequately enough modern warfare technologies like AI. Um, and so they've relied on um, Silicon Valley, which is a normal thing. That's throughout history what we've always done. I think you said something like $63 billion was spent by the G-Mafia yeah. in 2017 on yeah, R&D. And, and how much by the US government? I don't know, is it worth Action. counting? Yeah. Right, almost nothing. Two billion or something. Um, we don't yeah. have, you know, not only is it, there's no funding, but wh who? Which department in the federal government is supposed to be built? You know, the, like you can, you can wag your finger at Amazon all you want, but our government, it lives on AWS cloud. So th th this is the problem. So, so now you've got um, people working at Google uh, who rightfully so got really angry about Project Maven 
um, and some other initiatives, joint initiatives uh, that had to do with the military and, and as of this morning, some, some that have to do with China. And why do you think rightfully so? Because, so again... Well, maybe just describe for those in the room who don't know the Project Maven controversy. Yeah, so, well, there's been, there have been a few. Mm -hmm. And not just Google, also Amazon. Mm -hmm. So there was an initiative to... Uh, there's one initiative to help China build... Um, to, to bring Google back into China um, as, as an additional search engine, because for the most part, Baidu is, right. is the, the main And thing. that's the China issue, but what about the U.S. government issue? So you mean the military? Yeah. Okay. So there have been some military initiatives, um, some of which have to do with unmanned systems, um, some, of which have, uh, some of which have to do with facial recognition algorithms and law enforcement having access to all of that. So the people who... The problem is the people, the software engineers who've been working on these systems found out about it after the fact, uh, right? That's and so piece. people, yeah. so like, you know, 2000, I think it was Google employees took out a full page ad in the Times protesting um, the, the company's work on this, which then resulted in Google, too long after the fact, releasing a four page screed on its AI ethics. Right, except that it was entirely directed. It was entirely in response to, to Project Maven. Um, so again, this is where relationships and transparency helps a lot. Mm -hmm. You can't like uh, uh, we need. You know, our government needs the G Mafia mm -hmm. badly. Like we we don't work with badly them. dependent on it because we have no other option. That's right. Yes. Um, the government procurement process is impossible. So they've made it really, really hard for these companies um, to, to compete for, uh, for projects, which means that the process has become politicized. It takes on average 18 months to get a technology purchased by the US government. And that's, you know, you guys it's are crazy. moaning in the audience. That's two generations of technology yeah, out here it's in Silicon crazy. Valley. So that's impossible. On the flip side, um, you know, it's good, I think, that there is some at least transactional relationship, but if there's no transparency within these organizations and there's no codified set of AI values, that, that there's a clear set, like accountability train so everybody can see what's happening, um, and this is the era of fake news, and everybody's feeling anxious, and everybody's worried about confronting uncertainties, this is a recipe for disaster. So that's why I'm saying, of course, the people who are working for these companies got really upset. Mm -hmm. Of course they did. What, what did everybody expect was going to happen? Mm -hmm. But these are solvable, addressable problems. I mean, A little bit of communication. That's right. Yes, that's right. Uh, let me turn back to China. Um, what's your parade of horribles, worst case outcome as you see this technology race between China and the, and the West in AI? Mm -hmm. And what's your best case scenario? So my big fear at the moment uh, is that as China, China's been in the process of building something called a social credit score system. You might have also heard it called the social harmony score. It is not nationwide. There's been a lot of misunderstanding ar around what this actually is. And I think you could talk to both of us who've spent time in, in China. Um, there is a culture of tattletaling. Is that a good way to, yes. you know, it's right. So, and it's, so it's kind of normal that if you're doing something out of step with what's expected, somebody will tell on you who then tell on you, who will then tell on you. And then, you know, you will have, there will be some kind of repercussion. The social credit score system uses AI to automate this process. Um, however, the end result is a, a score versus a single demotion. Um, and you accrue points over time or you lose points over time depending on how you behave. So one way to lose points is to jaywalk. If you jaywalk, um, which is illegal, a uh, smart camera will recognize your face. It'll throw your face up on a digital billboard. It'll say what your name is, who your employer is. A note on social media will be sent. Um, you will, you know, if, if you're somebody who infra like has a lot of infractions, that may impact the scores of the people who you are friends with. Um, you know, you on the other not hand, be able to travel. You won't get train tickets to go that's right. home for so, five spring point, festival. 5.5 million people, according to the Chinese government's own data, were not able to buy train tickets in the last year because they didn't have high enough credit scores. 300,000 people performed meritorious work 
at their wherever they you know at their companies, um, and should have been in line for promotion, but got denied because their credit scores were too low. Now, that all sounds abhorrent. I hope to and us Orwellian, <laughs> right? <Yes. laughs> However, I think you know in my experience when I've talked to a lot of Chinese people. Um, there is no ex expectation of privacy. There is an assumption that they're being watched. Um, and the conveniences that go along with this are pretty compelling. Like, you don't have to have a boarding pass. You walk through the airport. Um, you just walk in. And uh, along the way, little cameras will ping on little message boards and tell you, you know, you've got to walk faster to get to, get to your gate. Mm -hmm. OK? All right. I, now, would, I would argue, though, that the surveillance in China has gotten far worse in the past three or four years, partly because it's now AI enabled and partly because Xi Jinping has cracked down so hard right. on dissent. So um, now, Chinese academics, where I would be friendly enough to normally go to their house, now will only see me walking. They say, let's go for a walk in public and please don't bring your cell phone. Uh, students that I lectured to at Beida, which is the Beijing University where Stanford has a center, said, oh, yeah, um, you know, I'm careful not to buy unhealthy snacks, back to your point of the Internet of Things coming to get you, because if I buy an unhealthy snack, it will ping my social credit score. And part of it is real, and part of it is sort of the penumbra mm -hmm. that you now think you are being watched every minute of every day and every decision, and it's all AI-enabled. And everywhere you walk, there's facial recognition. Right. You walk in Tiananmen Square, they know you were there. You walk in your hotel, they knew what time you got That's home. That's right. Now, here's Terrifying. my... So that is... But here's my concern. I am concerned for ethnic minorities yes. in China. But I'm also concerned for the Philippines. And I'm concerned for various parts of Africa. Why? Because this data collection package is a real attractive way for an autocratic leader to clamp down on people. Um, I have a friend, I have a, a journalist friend in the Philippines who is a well-meaning, hard-working individual who was only doing her job, who is in jail because Duterte doesn't like the fact that she is just reporting. Um, and you know, sh and it, you don't want to be in a Philippine jail. Um, my, my concern is that while some of this may feel normal in China, it doesn't feel normal in the 58 countries, the pilot countries where the BRI uh, is in full swing. Literally hours ago, Italy joined the Belt and Road Initiative. No, that doesn't mean they signed up for the social credit system. It but doesn't. It's just but China's influence as a tech power is expanding. But here's, right. so, but here's where the, the <coughs> catastrophic scenario comes into play. Um, the, the purpose of a scenario in my line of work as a futurist is to lend texture and understanding um, using data and evidence that we currently have access to as we mod model out plausible futures so that we can make better decisions and better strategy. So, you know, if it's the case that China is, is shaping a new world order with all of these countries aligned with it and the social credit score is working out real well for everybody, isn't it plausible that if we do not have a social credit score, we do not gain entry to the one China countries? And that we don't get to do business with the one China countries? And when I've mentioned this before to economists, they immediately say, our economy is too important. We're, our economies are too intertwined, right? Um, but if you stop and think about China at scale and these emerging markets at scale, I'm not saying that this definitely happens. I'm not saying it doesn't happen either, though. And it's not going to happen overnight. Um, so we have, a, we have an opportunity now to think this through. And rather than antagonizing China, as we've been doing, and retreating from the world stage, now is a really good time to think about building a coalition. Right? Because I believe that our future wars, it's possible will be fought with big planes and missiles. It's also possible that our future war is going to be an economic one that we've, we've never seen before. Fought in an entirely different way with code, not traditional combat. Mm -hmm. And that scares me. Right. Perfect. Now everyone's terrified. <laughs> So tell us how we're going to get out of yeah, this. Yeah, so how do we fix it now? <laughs> um, so here's the deal. Uh, um, I believe, I believe that, that there is hope. 
Um, I believe that the future has not yet been written and that we're writing it right now in the present. Um, so with that being said, uh, every one of us has a stake in, in creating a better future. Um, one of the proposals that I'm making is for something that I call Gaia, the Global Alliance on Intelligence Augmentation. Um, this is meant to be uh, sort of in the, in the spirit of Bretton Woods, um, an, an international uh, organization where everybody has an equal seat at the table, governments, the big nine, you know, economists, other, other kinds of people, um, where we, we tackle these big problems on behalf of everybody. So rather than preventing artificial general intelligence or creating, one proposal is to create these sentinel a AGI systems that go fight the bad AGI systems um, that we create, uh, which is crazy, we create um, guardrails that are, and, and enforce transparency and develop economic incentives along the lines of what I mentioned with the personal data records and, the, and distributed ledger. Um, and we create a human values atlas uh, where we chart and recalibrate continually every value that we all have all around the world, and that's what gets encoded into our decision-making systems. Um, you know, so and we reward risk modeling. Um, so, so that's one big proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're not saying that you would keep China out of it. No, you're I'm just very much saying the they need to be. The standards will be really high, and anyone who's willing to rise to those high standards, we'd love to have you join. That's right, and my hope is that everybody comes to the table. If not, those who would come to the table would have leverage and would penalize China in some way for not playing along. Mm -hmm. I believe this is a solution where everybody can win. Um, but again, now is a good time. Like you've heard the thing where like the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. This is our 20 years ago, planting the tree situation. So, so that's one thing. Um, the big nine companies, or at least the G Mafia, uh, should come together, create a codified list of values, um, and be very transparent in how they are enforcing those values. Um, so I have a list of 15 in the book, um, but those 15 questions can also be asked by any industry, any company that's working in AI. Um, we have to fix the university system. Because let me just back up for yep. a second. Yep. Because what's happening now is that there are a few AI researchers and others. There's the Asilomar principles. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of nascent efforts to define values around artificial intelligence. <laughs> but mostly it's, and you point this out in the book, it's each company comes out with a little thing that says, this is what we're going to do. There's no enforcement. Right. No one's really thought it through. And worse, some countries now are starting to do this. So Canada has its own proposal for a set of AI values. I know the EU is talking about this. The last thing that we want are all the different countries around the world to have their own perspectives with no coordination or collaboration. Um, there's a significant problem in our universities. Um, all universities talk about inclusivity and changing the pipeline, and I see zero evidence of them do, taking any action. So um, we need to, to have more brown and black people with, who, are, who have tenure. Um, it would be great to see more women who have tenure um, and to see more inclusivity. Um, and also not having a single ethics class or a single policy class. I mean, that's wonderful, though, that you're doing that. but. Um, but a lot of times, if there's like a mandatory ethics class, that's just something that everybody powers through. They check it off the list, and then that's that. We have to fundamentally shift how we're thinking about teaching. 100%. Um, Let me just add yeah. an example here. So I just taught at Stanford a class called Technology and Public Policy that discusses that should be mandatory for everybody issues who exactly for AI and for cybersecurity and for bio and and how do you think about this as a technologist going out into the world what do you think about what you're constructing not just how to do it but why are you doing it and how can you do it carefully to preserve humanity Stanford is also making a big push on ethics in AI and ethics in computer science and there's now a little bit of a movement afoot and you're one of the leaders of them that should be a class at every university in the country that has a technical program. Mm -hmm. It just should be. I'm and so right glad now it's not mandatory. That. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so again, these are not, you know, th these are small shifts. They, they really are. These are, these are low hanging pieces of fruit. And I guess the, the very last piece of this is you. Every person sitting in this room, I think, has a moral obligation and a civic duty to understand what the hell you're talking about <laughs> uh, when somebody says the two little letters AI. 
um, because at some point we're all using these systems. We are all making a decision about whether or not we're going to upload our face to see which fine art f painting we look like. Um, we need to be more skeptical of these systems and ask better questions, demand more of our politicians, and make better business decisions when we're making decisions about what vendors to use and which systems to upload our data to and um, how to deal with data encryption and governance. All of us sitting in this room have an obligation. Thank you. Thank you. We will leave it there. Thank you to Amy Webb for joining us this evening. We'd also like to remind our audience here that copies of Amy's book, The Big Nine, which really is good, I've actually read it and it's amazing, are available for purchase and she's happy to sign them in a couple of minutes. I'm Anya Manuel, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.